Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah in his breakdown or his categorization of humanity into three categories that from among, among mankind there's the type of person who says that they believe in Allah and in the last day, but they are not believers. <clears throat> Allah continues to say that they try to fool Allah and those who believe, but they only fool themselves and they don't realize it. <clears throat> in their hearts is a disease. And Allah has increased their disease. And for them is a painful punishment because they are liars. As we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these, these verses are from amongst the first few verses. They're verses 8, 9, and 10 in Surah Al-Baqarah. In the first five verses, Allah describes the believers, the Muslims. In the next two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the disbelievers. And then Allah spends a lot of time, several, several ayats, describing the group of people 
who are known as Munafiqeen or hypocrites. You have to keep in mind <clears throat> that when we say Munafiq or hypocrite in, in, in Arabic or in Islam, it's different from when we say hypocrite in English. Like, for example, if I told you, I said, man, I ain't going to never wear Timberland boots. I hate Timberland. The manufacturer who makes Timberlands is a racist person, blah, 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 blah. And then next week you see me wear a pair of Timberland boots on, with a pair of Timberland boots on. I said, I made you a hypocrite. You talking all that trash about Timberland last week. You wearing a pair right now. That's kind of how we use the term hypocrite in English. Somebody that says there's something or they, they project to be one way and they turn out to be a, a different way. But in Islam, hypocrisy or nifaq is different. It is more comprehensive than that. A, nif, a, a munafik or a hypocrite is someone, and right now we're talking about a full-blooded hypocrite. Somebody that's straight up a hypocrite. A hypocrite is someone who knows they're not Muslim. They don't believe in Islam or certain key tenets of Islam. Hmm. But they pretend to be Muslim. Outwardly, everything about them is Islamic. This is a munafik. Nifaq is a disease, as the verses that one of the one of the verses we have, we have quoted. In their hearts is a disease. And Allah has increased their disease. Right? So nifaq is a disease of the heart. Nifaq or hypocrisy is a disease of the heart. It's something that's internal. You can't see it. You only see signs of hypocrisy. You can't see the actual nifaq, the hypocrisy. A full-blooded, a full-blown hypocrite knows that they're not Muslim on a conscious level. But they pretend to be Muslim for some other reason. Externally, we treat them like they're Muslims. Why? Because you can't tell them. You, they do everything that we do. And in many cases, they do it better than us. But with Allah on the day of judgment, they are disbelievers. And the lowest level of the hellfire is reserved for them, as Allah stated in the Quran. They are below the disbelievers in the hellfire. The disbelievers, because a disbeliever straight up, I, I'm not Muslim, I don't believe in it, you know, do your thing. Even the ones that are fighting Islam, openly. <clears throat> but the munafiq, the hypocrite, he's pretending. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. So he gets treated as a Muslim because the Muslims don't know any better. Unless he or she trips up and exposes themselves. But other than that, you treat them like a Muslim. You don't go around and investigate, sneak, and search, and spy. Because that's not your business. We are taught that if you spy, on another Muslims, if you go looking for their faults, not what they're doing openly in front of everybody, if you go looking for some faults, Allah will expose your faults. Even if you hide them in the deepest crevice of your house, Allah will expose your faults. If you make it your business going around searching and spying and looking for the faults of your brother Muslim. And so this is important to understand the definition of hypocrisy. A full-blown hypocrite knows that they're a hypocrite. They, knows that they know that they're not Muslim. Don't get that confused with uh, ayatul nifaq or alamatul nifaq or signs of hypocrisy. It's two different things. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in the well-known hadith that the signs of a hypocrite are three. And there are more signs than that, but he just mentioned one, these three in this particular hadith, and one thing about hip hypocrites, lying goes with them like hand in glove. Like America and 
apple pie or America and slavery. You don't have one without the other, right? You know, hypocrisy and lying, they go together. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when they speak, they lie. When you trust them with something, they prove treacherous. In other words, you can't trust them. And when they give you an oath or a promise, they break it. And then in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever has any of these four characteristics is a full-blown hypocrite unless and until they give up at least one of these characteristics. So in, other words, in this other hadith that we're about to mention, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever has these four character traits all together at the same time, they are a full-blown hypocrite. And he mentioned the three characteristics that we just mentioned in the other hadith. And then he included with that, when you argue with him, he abuses you. In other words, you can't get into a debate with this brother or sister. The brother or sister end up cursing you out, talking trash about you. You can't stick to the subject. You should disrespect you. You add those three characteristics to that one, this person's a full-blown him. The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were on guard for hypocrisy. And in fact, they say the only one who feels secure from being a hypocrite is the hypocrite. In other words, the only one who's like, I ain't a hypocrite, that's the hypocrite. Because all of the Sahaba themselves were scared of hypocrisy, Nifaq. Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala, and who is famous about him. He, we know that he was one of the ten companions that, were, that was promised paradise. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him while he's walking on earth, you're going to Jannah. He told him he was going to paradise. But yet and still, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death, he would always go to Hudayfa al-Yaman. Hudayfa is who? He was, he's a secret, one of the uh, uh, secret keepers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a secret keeper of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was an expert on the signs of the last days. And he used to ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about bad things. Because he said in the well-known hadith that he said, I used to ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about sharp, about evil. While the other companions used to ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about khair, about good. The reason why I asked about these evil things, so I wouldn't know what to avoid so I could stay away from it, so I won't fall into it. Another thing that who they for knew, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Hudayfa who the hypocrites were by name. Made him promise not to tell anybody. So after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umar used to keep bugging Hudayfa. Ya Hudayfa. Am I one of the people that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam named? Remember, he was promised paradise. But he was still worried about that disease of hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah, yeah Umar, you know I can't tell you. Umar, you know, he's, this is how diligent he was. You know, hypocrites, you're not supposed to pray over them. So if a Muslim died in Medina, who was a Sahaba, and he see who they were absent from the Janazah, mm -hmm. he wouldn't go. So it was like he just watched who they were. <laughs> such and such, right there, Allah Ta'ala, I knew who just died. Who they were going to Janazah? I ain't going either there. Remember, this is, wouldn't be so significant if we wasn't talking about Umar, who was promised paradise. But yet, he's still worried about the hypocrisy. That's not something that any of us can feel comfortable of. And you know, finally, he kept bugging and bugging and bugging and bugging Hudayfa. And then Hudayfa said, All right, well, no, you're not one of them. You, he ain't mentioned you. <laughs> So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us Amen. from Nifa. A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajim, bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa aftulu salat wa atamu taslim. على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورادي الله تعالى أن سادة التابعين وعلماء العاملين وأعمة الأربعة المجتهدين وطالبهم إلى يوم الدين What I want to do in the last few minutes is I kind of want to zoom in to 
Amiru Munafikin, the leader of the hypocrites during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want to just mention certain key things about him and his history so that we can know to avoid these things. Because he's the quintessential munafic. He's the hypocrite. The, the hypocrite. That's the role, hypocrite, the role model of hypocrisy. Literally, if we was, the Muslims were to write a dictionary, and we have, but like a dictionary in the Western sense, like a Webster's dictionary, you know how sometimes they have a picture there. You know, you put a hypocrite should have uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay like this. Take a picture because he was the hypocrite and the leader of the hypocrites. But, as we said, hypocrite, hypocrisy is something in the heart. It's not something that you do. The things you do which are motivated by hypocrisy, they're the result. They're not the cause. It's, we need to look at this. It's very important. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salu, he was from amongst the Khazraj. The Khazraj is one of the two tribes who became Muslim and became known as the Ansar, the helpers. You really don't understand him in the social dynamic until you go back prior to Islam. Prior to Islam, just to uh, summarize, the Aus and the Khazraj were always fighting each other. And then you had basically three Jewish tribes who basically would always play themselves, uh, play the uh, Aus and the Khazraj against each other. And they, and they kept them divided and fighting each other for their own protection. You have Banu Nadir, you got Banu Kainuka, and you got Banu Koreza. Koreza. Jew, three Jewish tribes. You got the Khazraj, the Aus. Aus, Khazraj. Always fighting each other. During the Battle of Buath, which took place several by a generation before Islam came. Most of the leaders from these two tribes were killed in this battle. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha makes it a point and is mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari. She said that this war, this battle of Bu'ath set the stage for them becoming Muslim. Because see, the older people from Aus and the Khazraj, you know, usually they stuck in their ways. They don't want to change. You get a certain age, you know, you're averse to change. And so the, the older elders that were used to fighting and used to arguing with one another and used to being aligned to different, the different Jewish tribes, they were killed in this battle. So a new crop of leadership sprung up that took, took, took to take the leadership of these two tribes. And these group of leaders, they wanted to make peace. They didn't want to continue fighting anymore. And so... They looked for ways to bring about peace among themselves, and the first thing they did was they agreed to make Abdullah ibn Ubay their king. Why him? He was one of the leaders of the Khazraj. The Khazraj lost the battle of Buath, the Aus won. But Abdullah ibn Ubay didn't have any blood on his hands. See, you know, this was like, okay, y'all won, y'all beat us. But as a conciliation, you know, our leader that can bring about peace among us, we can make them from your, you know, your tribe, the Khazraj. You know, your laws. And we like him because he didn't really kill anybody from our part, so we don't got no personal beef or grudge against him. While all of this was going on, a group of them went to Mecca and became Muslim and gave the bay'ah to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this happened two years in a row. This is known as bay'ah al Aqaba, ula wa thani, the first and the second, the bay'ah of Aqaba. Two years in a row, and so we know because of this, then the Hijra came, and then Islam and Yathrib, the city became known as Medina. So when it came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everybody almost kind of forgot about Abdullah bin Ubay. 
He's about to be the king. He's about to be the leader, the chief. And all of a sudden, I blew who? Oh, yeah, that guy. And so this word, this was a seed or the root of his hypocrisy. He felt like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stole something from him. He felt like he was supposed to be the chief. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and stole it from him. So that was his animosity right there. And then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to Medina, and he would, the people would be sitting in little groups and little sec sections. And the Prophet Sallallahu, because everybody wasn't like Muslim at the time, it was still a lot of people didn't become Muslim until later. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go to different circles and remind them about the hereafter and, you know, uh, about Islam in general. Then he would go to a circle that had Abdullah ibn Ubay there. And like, come on, I want to hear that crap. Man, get out of here with all that stuff. Talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he would, like, do little stuff like that even after he took Shahada. Like, come on, man. I, we ain't in the masjid, man. Come on, man. I want to hear all that. That's how, literally how he would talk. And people would be like, yo, who is he talking to? He's talking to the messenger of Allah like that. And some people wanted to do something to him. And some of the Sahaba from Medina would be like, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not defending him, but you got to keep in mind that we were in the process of putting the crown on his head when we became Muslim. So, you know, he got something he got to work out. And so look at these characteristics on, on this person. The uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. And the Khazraj, they were aligned with the Jewish tribe, Banu Kainuka. In other words, they were the muscle for Banu Kainuka, and they had like a mawala, like a protected friendship. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks a lot about Islamic brotherhood in the Quran, taking precedence over all other brotherhood, and he talks about taking the Christians and Jews as awliyat. He's talking about this. Yeah, you have the Dina Amunu, let that Takidu Yahu, when I saw the Aliyah, back to whom Aliyahu back, for in Tawala Minu, for in the Huminu. Oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians as protecting friends. They are protecting friends of one another. Whoever from amongst you does that, it will be counted from amongst them. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. See, the, 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 the Khazraj had this relationship with Banu Kainuka. And that so called protection, that friendship, you know, it superseded everything else. So it meant, you know, you know we, we tight. If anything goes against you or goes against me, we all going to ride out together. And in their mind, particularly uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, that included the Muslims. So if a Muslim got in the beef with Banu Kainuka, he's riding with Banu Kainuka. He's not riding with the Muslims, even though he's Muslim. Six twenty-four, about two years after the hijra of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a Muslim woman is shopping in the marketplace of Banu Kainuka, and she's trying to buy and sell some jewelry. And the Jewish shopkeeper gave her a problem because she had her whole face, her whole body covered, her whole face covered. And this is before the ayat of hijab. She had her whole face covered. And, she, and he didn't want to do business, so there was an argument that took place. So he tried to be smart. So when she sat down to do business on the ground, he pinned down her overgarment. So that when she stood up, she was stripped butt naked in the marketplace. And a Muslim heard the commotion, by the time he got there, the Muslim sister's naked. And so he killed the Jew who did it. Then the Jews jumped on him and killed him. This news got back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to take action against Banu Kainuka. And you, I mean, SubhanAllah, I mean, just let me drive the point home. You don't understand what's going on. Say a Muslim sister goes to Monroeville Mall and she's in one of the stores. She gets into an argument with a disbeliever. And a disbeliever takes off all of her clothes. She's butt naked. 2014, Monroeville Mall. Right? A Muslim sees it. He gets into it with the person who did it. 
Two murders happen. The news gets back to the masjid. What do you expect the imam to do? See, when the news got back to uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to make moves on the, on, on, the, on the whole tribe because, number one, there is a treaty that the Muslims have with the Jews in Medina. They're supposed to protect the city and not harm each other. They all agreed to that. So they disrespected the Muslim woman. And so because of that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the whole tribe got to go. Because he disrespected one Muslim woman. And that's back then when there was some modesty and shyness. You might say, hey, now, so the women are walking around naked anyway. What's the big deal? So what? The Muslim women here, she would still be embarrassed. Even if she had the body that people were getting plastic surgery to look like, and she was a dime or whatever, she was all of that, and she, her underwear was a dirty, best case scenario. You strip off her clothes, she's going to be embarrassed because she's a pious Muslim sister. And then the news gets back to the bastion. What do you expect the imam to do? Well, see, well, maybe we should, uh, Talk to who's in city council, right? You know, the question. Well, well, we got a good relationship with that chain of stores that they're happening, mm -hmm. sister. Maybe we should <laughs> overlook it. No, she ain't trying to hear all that. Her honor was disrespected. Kulu Muslim, ala Muslim haram. Everything from one Muslim to another Muslim is sacred. Blood, property, and honor. That Muslim sister's honor was disrespected, and a Muslim man paid the price of that. He didn't say. Oh man, they deep over there. We go back later. <laughs> no, he took care of it on the spot, and he got killed. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "All of y'all gotta go." What up, Abdullah Ibn Ubay said? He said, "Yo, I mean, yo, stop! No, don't, don't do it. We got agreements with them." And he kept going on and on and on and on because <coughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was actually gonna move on them. He was going to uh, fight them, go to war. Abdullah ibn Ubay, he kept, and, and, and Muhammad, he wasn't like Yara Rasulullah. Hey, Muhammad, chill, chill. We have, uh, think, think about our agreements with them. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yo, because he even grabbed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, yo, let me go. And so then he said, all right, the day your responsibility, and he expelled it. He expelled them from Medina. So Abdullah ibn Ubay was responsible <laughs> for them not getting killed. Why were they going to get killed? Because they disrespected them with some women. Keep that in mind. This is Abdullah ibn Ubay. In the third year of Hijra, after the Battle of Badr, the Quraysh wanted to get revenge against the Muslims in Medina. And so they marched out and they camped at Uhud. 3,000 of them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took sure with his companions. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, he's supposed to do. Sha'wilhum fil amr. Consult with them in affair. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was of the opinion that they should stay in Medina and fight the Kufar from inside Medina. This is the first time that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Abdullah ibn Ubay for his opinion. Abdullah ibn Ubay agreed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, I think we should stay here in Medina and fight. You know, our history dictates that, you know, anytime we fight an enemy from inside, we never lose. So, you know, yeah, we should stay, stay right here and fight. <coughs> A lot of the Muslims who didn't fight at Bakr were anxious to fight at Uhud because Bakr was last minute. It wasn't supposed to be a war. So it was basically whoever was strapped up and ready was able to fight. If you wasn't ready, you just missed. So a lot of people were like, Man, I didn't get a chance to fight next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to, to, to give up my life for the sake of Allah. So they were so anxious. Nah, we can wait here, fight. Let's go. Let's, yeah, Rasulullah, let's go out and fight. Come on. Let's please. Come on, let's go. So they was like, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went in his house, thought about it, put on his armor. We're going out to fight. He went against his own opinion. The people who were anxious to go out and fight said they felt bad. It was like they felt like maybe they pressured the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And he's and he's like, y'all so loud. Whatever you, we submit to whatever your opinion is. And you know you want to stay whatever. We sorry for you know being you know imposing our opinion on you. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is not proper for a prophet that once he puts on his battle armor that he takes it off until he fights. So now, in other words, I made the decision. We're gonna go with it. It's over with. And that's a trait of a good leader. You don't just get in the middle of something and go, what do you think? I don't know. Should I? You know, just, I, I don't know. No, you make, you, you take sure, you make your decision, you go with it. And so, Abdullah ibn Ubay, they marching out to the battle. Abdullah ibn Ubay was like, and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't listen to me. And he going out here, we're going to get murdered, man. There's 3,000 of them. It's only 1,000 of us. He should have listened to me anyway. Now I'm going back to Medina, man. He turned back around, 300 other people went with him, and so now the Muslims only got 700. And this is extremely important, because all of, this, all of this time that we're talking about, all the instances that we mentioned, it wasn't clear that Abdullah ibn Ubay was a hypocrite at the time. All of the, a lot of the ayahs dealing with the signs of hypocrisy, and a lot of these hadith that we mentioned were mentioned, but it wasn't like, clear about him. Even though people suspect it wasn't clear. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, and this is after the battle of Uhud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذَرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزَ الْقَرِيثَ مِنَ الْطَيِّبِ This is Surah 3, Ayat 179. Allah will not leave the believers in their same condition in which they now find themselves. Until he separates the khabith from the tayyib. The khabith is filth. Something that's dirty, like nations, najasa. Until he separates the filth from what is pure. The filth is talking about the hypocrites. And the pure is talking about the believers. And so what this verse means is that, you know, you're busy speculating, arguing, who's a believer, who's not a believer, and all that kind of stuff. That's not your job to worry about that. Allah is going to make a situation happen where the line is going to be drawn in the sand. And that's going to clearly show you who's who. That's a lesson for us. You don't try to figure out, was it this hard? Why are you acting no funny? Why are you doing that? What, what was it? No, don't worry about all that. Time will tell. Be patient. Allah does what he wants. Finally, man, you read. And he brings the truth out when he wants it to come out. Something's going to happen, and you're going to be on one side, you're going to be looking at them, like, I thought you were supposed to be over here. <laughs> nah, I ain't picked you up. Man, there's 3,000 of us. There's only 1,000 of us. I'm going back to Medina. And a whole lot of eyes were revealed about it. So that situation for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during that time was the Battle of Uhud, where the line was drawn in the sand. Oh, okay, yeah. You left the battlefield? That's a major sin in Islam. You want to wait out to the battle, and you turn around. And then when you read the Quran, they come up with some stupid excuses. Had we known there was fighting going to take place, surely we would have been there. What do you mean, had we known there was fighting going to take place? You was marching on the way out to the battlefield. So that's Abdullah bin Ubay, the battle of Uhud. In the fourth year of Hijrah, in Rabi al Awl, Battle Nadir, the other Jewish tribe. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with some of the Sahaba to collect some blood money. Somebody had killed somebody and based upon the agreement that they had that they, was, they would help chip in to pay the blood money of the person that was killed. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba were sitting by a wall, like a high, there's a wall behind them. And so Jews from Bani Nadir came with like a big rock and was about to drop it on his head. Kill him. He didn't know. <clears throat> Angel Jabril came and told him, he didn't give a whole long explanation. Angel Jabril said, get up, walk, leave. <laughs> right? And then he just got up and left, and the Sahaba didn't know it. They got up and followed him. Angel Jabril told him, why? They just tried to assassinate you. Mm -hmm. oh, you got to go. Abdullah ibn Ubay tried to intervene with that. Tried to kill his prophet. Ah, oh, no, be merciful to them. Don't. In this situation, uh, he gave the uh, decision over to uh, one of the other Sahabas of the Ansar, who was their protector, who, who had relationship with them in the, in the Jahaliyyah, and his, his name is Sa'ad, and, uh, and his decision 
but based upon their treachery, he said, all of them, kill all of them, every single one of them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam carried out his judgment. <clears throat> 627, the sixth year of uh, Sha'ban, the Battle of Bani Mustalak. A whole lot of things happened during that time. Two things that concern us and Abdullah ibn Ubay. Number one, that uh, one of the Ansar and one of the Muhajirin got into an a argument. Like it was one of them kicked one of them or something like that. And, and Abdullah ibn Ubay used that situation to try to cause division. He tried to, he tried to say something slick. He said, See, look, look, look at this. See what happens? You, you know, you let a stray dog into your house, you feed him, nurse him back to health, and he end up biting you. This is what he called it, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muhajirun. He called him, he referred to him like a dog. Because the, the Muhajirun let the, let the Ansar let the Muhajirun in. They let him in the Medina, excuse me, and treated him with hospitality, etc. And so one of the Muhajirun kicked one of the Ansar. It's like, you know, you bite the hand that feeds you. So he used this small disagreement <clears throat> and was like, you see how we, we, we treated them well and everything, we let them into our homes, and now they look, they outnumbered, they about to outnumber us, they're kicking us, they're treating us all kind of way. You know what? When we get back to Medina, the most honorable of us is going to kick out the lowest of us. In other words, basically, translated, when we get back to Pittsburgh, it's on and cracking. In other words, we, all, we out here dealing with them, when we get back to Pittsburgh, I'm going to show you what it's hitting for. That's basically what he, what he said. And so, when he got back to Medina, you know, and this is mentioned in the Quran, when he got back to Medina, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he had a son, his name was also Abdullah, but he was a sincere Muslim. And so, when he got back to Medina, his son entered the city first and waited at the gates of Medina. And then when his father went to walk in, he wouldn't let his father pass. And he was like, well, you ain't let me in. He was like, he, was like, uh, he told him, he said, you know, you described the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as being lowly or whatever, 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 and you think you're the king of this city, you're not the king of this city. He's the, uh, he's the king of this city. You can't come in. I'm not letting you in. And then so he wouldn't let his own father enter the city. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told me, he said, let him in. It's cool. let, 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 let him in. Then he let him in. And then the amazing thing about it is, his son, Abdullah, went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked for permission to kill his own father. He asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, let me kill my father. And let me tell you why I want to kill him. Not only because he's a hypocrite, but I still naturally love my father. And I don't want none of your sahaba, none of your other companions to do it. And I don't want to have any enmity in my heart against another Muslim for killing my father. So just let me do it. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that. Nah, I don't want people to say Muhammad kills his own companions. Let, let him ride. He get a pass. Another thing that happened in Bani, Bani Mustala is the slander of Aisha. The slander of Aisha. Aisha was, sl was slandered. Now I'm not going to go into the story. You know the story. But why? what does this have to do with Abdullah ibn Ubay? It has to do with Abdullah ibn Ubay. It's because he started the slander. He gassed the slander up. And this is one thing you got to catch with the hypocrites. Because when you look at the slander of Aisha, none of the hypocrites got, got punished for it. The sincere ones got punished for it. We mean the sincere ones. The people that got caught up in the gossip, and we're just talking about it openly, because they ain't care so, yes, right, I said it. Yeah, she got punished, da, 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 da. They got punished for it. They got the 80 lashes. The hypocrites are smooth enough not to get caught out in the open saying it. Well, I, we don't know what did happen in the desert out there. You know, hey, she young, ain't she? Hey. Talking, talking all that like that. They didn't get punished. And that's why the hypocrites are a danger to the other people because sometimes they, the, the people that they, that they influence <coughs> get caught up and they think they're being sincere. So we just mentioned these things about Abdullah ibn Ubay because like Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, we want to stay away from him. Look at the life of Abdullah ibn Ubay and take a lesson for it. This is not just a history lesson. We want to stay away from characteristics like uh, like uh, those of uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take our souls and none of us have any nifaq in our hearts. Amen. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us sincere Muslims and die on Iman. Amen. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make la ilaha illallah Muhammad wa rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our last word. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika na shakum wa la ilaha illallah wa astaghfirullah wa tubu ilayhi. Bismillah.